what we're going to do is uh, try to cram in a lot of stuff about teaching. And uh, of course, I'm a big supporter of SAW, the Sequential Art Institute, uh, art workshop, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Tom Hart was my mentor, and he got me started. I'm a teacher in New York. I'm Josh Bear, and Tom Hart has been completely instrumental uh, through his generosity and his example as an artist and as a teacher, uh, and sort of like his belief in comics to get me from being kind of like nowhere when I was like 15 years ago when I wasn't even a student to the point where I am now where I teach comics semi-professionally. Yeah. And so he's one of my biggest mentors and I also go to SAW uh, a couple times, like every year, every other year to help teach workshops. And I'm Josh Barron, and this is Sally. Hey, I'm Sally Cantorino. Um, Tom Hart was also my mentor. He was my pre-college teacher at School of Visual Arts in New York. Um, I've, so I've basically been making comics kind of under Tom's guidance since 2005. Um, so I came down to Saul when he started it um, on his invitation. And now I went through the, um, the full year program at Saul and I teach the teen classes, like high school and middle school age classes. Um, and our styles are different. I'd say Sally's tighter than me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> just different aesthetics. <laughs> so let's just, let's just hit it ground running, because it's a lot to cram in. We're going to spend the first half hour talking about some of our um, pro tips. I, I hate using the word professional, but uh, <laughs> say pro tips. And I'm going to talk about something that I'm not sure what drawing level people are at, uh, but these hopefully should work on all levels. So um, one thing if, for cartooning that is um, um, can't be under valued is drawing hands and feet. Uh, it's okay not to know how to draw hands and feet or to draw them, kind of wing it. Um, because, you know, you can do a hand that's kind of wrong but looks great. You know, you can just kind of, just it's expressive. But there's a lot of common mistakes that people make uh, that you want to avoid. Uh, one of them is uh, this effect. You see a lot of people when they do hands, They'll do this gesture like when somebody's kind of doing like almost a theatrical kind of gesture, a uh, like a threatening kind of claw gesture. And they'll do this. Each So far, this hand looks okay. Each finger's a little bit further. Hey, can you kids see over here, by the way? Okay. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, uh, the fingers, each one's a little bit further away than the last. Uh, they're trying to twist. What should happen right now is this finger's going to come back towards the center point because Fingers tend to close like a starfish closing. So when they close, they come, they don't just, it's not just like you folding, folding a piece of paper in half. They come towards a central point. Yeah, because there's all like muscle and tissue and fat on here, you know, inside. So it's not just like a piece of paper folding. You know, even if you try to fold your hand like this, it doesn't go in half. If you try to make this gesture, like the, doing this the wrong way would be like, each finger's a little bit further away, and so the last one's gonna be going way out here, like like wheat blowing in the wind. And if you try to make that gesture, you find that your pinky comes boomeranging back towards the center. Even if you try to make sort of like a, I don't know, it reminds me of the gesture that uh, in, in uh, Ed Wood, when the dude's oh. triple jointed and he's making like a crazy Dracula hand. Yeah. Um, the other thing about hands I want to throw in there is, do a straight, you can do a simple shape like this, and this is going to come to one of my next tips before I let Sally go into hers. Uh, make uh, a ball, and then um, always keep track, do a light line, and keep track of where the knuckles are. If you, you're not going to see this line in finished drawing, it's there for your benefit. The fingers are built on top of this ball, which represents the palm, and they are basically the same length as the palm. I make all my fingers the same length as each other too, because I don't want to mess around with making the pinky, trying to make the pinky small and the middle finger bigger. Just make them all the same length and people aren't going to notice. And if you look at art history, a lot of pe there's a lot of there's artists a, who draw their fingers the same way. just fudge anatomy in art history, but they do it really well. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they just do it very confidently and like, you don't notice that somebody's got like five extra vertebrae. <laughs> And um, the thumb, the good good way to think about the thumb, especially at the beginning, if it seeming, seems frustrating, just draw it like a chicken drumstick. <laughs> and have it connect down here. A lot of times I'll tell people this, and they hear me, 
and then they guess where it's connected and they put it here, yeah. it's lower. It's down here. So you draw a line here, and that should be the 25% mark. Here's the knuckles, and that's a 50% point. And just as simple, the simple things can keep you centered when you're drawing the hand. Another quick thing is that when you put your hands together like this, they kind of you push out the knuckles a little bit, they form a diamond. So that means that if you draw somebody with their hand leaning against the wall, just draw half of a diamond, or maybe you might call it a pyramid shape. Sideways pyramid, right? Right there. Yeah. Whoops, there we go. <laughs> I could go on and on, Sally. I think oh, oh, no, I just want to say that I think I start in a similar way when I'm drawing hands, where I you know, I usually start with of like a, a rounded square and it's the same thing like here's where the knuckles are um, because when you I mean when you look at your knuckles they don't they're not straight across they kind of curve um, but also like Josh you know you kind of when you look at your hand you see there's sort of these you know if you kind of squeeze paint your hand like this you'll see that there's these two kind of half circles that start so I, kind of, I usually like to think about where those are um, as well, and you know, if I'm just drawing a hand, I tend to kind of just think. I don't break it down into each finger first. Um, I think about where the knuckles are and think of it as a unit. So, you know, if I'm drawing a very quick hand here. Also, your you know your fingers tend to kind of move together in like what you know it's even if you're like someone who plays piano or an instrument and you get really good at like moving your fingers independently, what you do with one tends to affect the other one, which kind of goes back to like it's really hard to get your pinky to do this thing, you know, like go because your ring finger goes with it. So, mm -hmm. um, the, yeah, I mean, you kind of start to think, like, find these little tricks. Um, you know, there's a certain sort of shape, like, I guess a three, you know, this shape like this that kind of starts in between because it's, you know, it's, it's just these, this uh, muscle and flesh and skin, you know, it gets squeezed, it gets moved, you get um, these little lines, and it's just like a visual shorthand. I th you know, the more that you draw, the more you'll start to <coughs> figure out the way you draw things, like the shortcuts that you draw, like, well, whenever I draw wrinkles, I tend to just kind of do this squiggle. And you know that's not how it may not always be how wrinkles actually look, but I've learned that it gets read as wrinkles, and so it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of the folds on the edge of the hand are a lot like yeah. folds that you see in pants, clothing, yeah. or fabric. Um, so because skin, is, yeah, because skin is elastic and skin. And don't feel intimidated. Don't feel like. I don't know, you know, there's a lot of rules here and yeah. uh, I have to follow them all. I've had, especially when I teach kids, I find that there's a lot of kind of rule breaking things that they do that I learned from. Like I had, yeah. a, I had one kid who I taught him how to do hands and he kind of listened to me, but then he went off and just made these big, fat, kind of macaroni fingers. <laughs> and I sort of loved it. It looked very Peter Max like. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's kind like, of liberating. It's like an Andre the Giant. <laughs> it's kind of liberating. It's kind of liberating, and there's something about just going, "Hey, man, I can make sort of like this underside of a thought balloon, this kind of like curving W shape, look like a finger," and it's very liberating. So um, you can also do a system where you just keep on trading off, have the side of the finger or the three quarter view of the finger be straight <coughs> on the back and kind of bumpy and fat on the bottom. But I find that no matter what you're doing, it's very helpful if you make, well, these are kind of the same length all the way through, which works well. You never want to have them get smaller towards the bottom, unless you want to do that and go really big with it. 
like really go and has this crazy, crazy throbbing carrot finger. I guess that could work because it's that old. Yeah, I think I, I think of this that with knuckles as well. Like I tend to kind of do these shape. You know, like I tend to kind of you know if I was drawing. where, you know, when your finger's flat like that, it dips where the knuckles are, you know, when your knuckles lock. So, kind of think of that. You can take off this pen, it's yeah. still a lot thicker, so you yeah. can Yeah, we're going to go from feet to talking about three hard. lines to talking about, do you know the 90% rule, 90 degree rule? Yes, yes. Talk about that a little bit, talk about lettering, and then the last half hour we're going to go straight to comics. I mean, talk straight to you guys doing comics. Yeah, whatever. I want <laughs> hand, you know, you can start sort of at an arbitrary point, but the hands are... Very I, useful for expression. So you, yeah. yeah. And it's good to, they can also really thwart you, so having a little bit of knowledge on your side can be very beneficial. I'm going to show you, let's do the feet a lot quicker. Yeah. I mean, I tend to think of it like, you know, you're, you have a ball of a heel and kind of a ball of your foot, and that's literally what it's called. And then it's, you know, if it's from the side or like, it's kind of, it, I think of it as like, okay, I'm connecting these two circular shapes. And my system is like this. Um, I tell people, I figured out a very simple formula for showing feet. It's, it is, it's all I'm made out of food. Picture an orange <laughs> and an avocado. And then take four, or a four, or a pear. <laughs> and take five uh, little olive wraps, <laughs> and put them right there. That's <laughs> I tend to make my foot flat on the bottom because I learned at one point that when I tried to make the art, art, arch. It's very easy to make the arch too big. That's right. <laughs> if you make it flat, then you can kind of shave it down bit by bit. Yeah. And you know when you've gone too far. It's re if you try to guesstimate, I, I don't know, I feel like this way it's, it's a lot easier to shave down. Um, also, as the foot lifts, I used to do this, and it would start to look weird. And I realized eventually it was because I wasn't, it's just, this is a very much like a wedge shape. It's, an, it's a going up at a slant. You have to have that go up as the rest of the foot rises. Yeah. I mean, if, if anyone has done dance or anything where you have to do stretching, you know, like if you're doing flex and point, just look, next time you do it, just kind of look at what your foot does when you point. It doesn't, you know, if you're pointing, it basically starts to go um, parallel to like, it's all, I can't show you because I'm not here. I know, you know, it's just kind of easier for me to like think of things with my body because I use myself as reference a lot. Mm -hmm. But you know, you start to kind of get, and it's not always directly a straight line, but you get this straight line happening when you, you know, when the foot lifts. Um, let's talk a little bit about storytelling. Clearly, this is everything you need to know about drawing the body. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It's done. <laughs> and, um, okay. I, mean, I, have, I have other stuff to talk about with drawing the body, but we can get to that at another point. Yeah, yeah, let's just cram it as much as yeah. we can until 3.30. Yeah, yeah. And, um, okay, does anybody know the 90 degree rule in film? I love answering this and getting, yeah. Yeah, it's about avoiding confusing your audience. If you, the idea is basically like, um, you, you think of, you think very much like the, the uh, venue that you're looking at us in now. Um, imagine looking at, pe looking at the comic as if it's a dollhouse or a stage with the wall cut away. A diorama. And, and what you want to do is imagine, like you have your scene here, I'm going to look at it from above, and you can do sort of a horseshoe shape from here to here, 
These are where your actors are from above. From here to here, you can basically show action before you'll get confused. Um, what I mean, is, if you think about a lot of old TV shows, like All in the Family or Family Ties or Seinfeld, um, uh, different strokes, they all have that staircase in the back of the set, and you never saw, they never all of a sudden set up this camera on the staircase and showed the action. You never saw the wall where that camera was. It's always like, the staircase is always in the back, and all in the family, the front door is always on the right. And if people are entering the stage, um, it can be really confusing if they start going all the way around and showing the room from different scenes. So it doesn't mean that you can't do comics with you know, having the camera swirling around, but it means that when you're starting to tell stories and you are running the risk of getting in over your head with storytelling, pull way back and keep things, or keep the 90 degree rule in mind. I usually find on a good comic page, which I wish I brought one in to show you, um, they'll, they'll have maybe one reversal, but if it's like, Mr. Natural is talking to Billy Bob or whatever. He's on the right all the way through the comic, even, even if they're walking through rooms, by the way. They tend to kind of give the character their own little, their own little domain on that side of the frame, and they keep it consistent. And, and part of it is, um, you know, who's talking first in the frame? Um, I mean, because if you're doing a panel, like, Say you, you know, I'm not even trying to draw, but you know, if you have, you want, the, you know, the person, you know, punk Joe here on the left to be the first one talking, um, you know, you don't want to put him on the right and then have, you know, punk Bob here <laughs> speaking. Like, if this is supposed to be one and this is two, it's not going to work, you're always going to read this one first, unless you put, you know, this one significantly on top of two, where, you know, because you, you read from left to right, so you have to think of your audience is going to look at the panel from left to right, and is going to read the bubbles from left to right. And so, you know, maybe, you know, you want Punk Joe to start on this side of the panel, because he's the first one to talk. And so that'll like affect everything. There's also something, um, there's actually, if you've ever seen Wally Lloyd's like 99 panels that always work, there's this shot that I call it soap opera vision, and it's when you kind of see from like behind somebody's head, and you, they're looking at, you know, you can see like somebody talking, but you have like this character's head in the foreground is like a silhouette. Um, so you, you know, and I mean if you're doing that within the context of the 90 degree rule, um, you know, with, with that too, I mean if, if you really want to like switch, you, I mean you can like kind of change the angle that people are looking at each other. So one way that it was illustrated to me when I was uh, taking a, a storyboarding class uh, was, think about this, if there's a car coming from the left in a film or a comic, and you switch and show up from the other side, I mean, aren't you going to think that they probably turned around and went back the way they were coming? And it might not be a huge problem in the comic. You might say if it's a scene, you know, if they're talking, so I've seen in Pulp Fiction, they're talking about choice cheeseburgers in France, you might have no problem understanding that they switch the angle because there's a fluidity to their conversation that unites it. But it still illustrates how something to watch for. And the key is that if you're going to do that shot, you want to take the viewer by the hand more. So this shot, car's coming to the left, coming towards us and then going the other way is shows the same action in a way where you're with you're with the car every step of the way. Yeah. I mean because you know you can assume that your viewer is gonna you know that your reader is going to have closure between <coughs> panels. But sometimes you like you just gotta help. Because <laughs> yeah. sometimes it's a really big jump and it, you don't want to confuse your reader. 
you like you want to give them the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> did did you have like any stuff? Did you have your own like list of things um, that you wanted to bring up independently? I mean, most of most of my list was like plan ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, and I mean, when I started making my list of like five essential things, they right. all ended up just being plan ahead. Um, First sort of in general with your story, like before you even start your you know, penciling your pages, have a thumbnail, like have your thumbnails, have something written down, know where you're going. Um, and also this is you know like this may seem kind of crazy when you to think of this when you first start, but think of how it's gonna be printed and think about doing things in proportion to what you're printing. Like, you know, if, I don't have any letter paper here, but you know, a way to figure that out, hey, this is um, you know, if you're saying like, okay, I want my mini comic, when I finish it to be half letter, you know, what's the kind of, there's, you know, there's like proportion wheels and ways to figure it out that use math. But what? <laughs> but nobody knows how to do math. Here. Mm -hmm. um, the easiest thing to do is take a ruler and line it up with these two corners, and then continue the line. And wherever you know, wherever this point is, that becomes your edge. So that that'll save you a lot of like heartbreak when you go to print it and you have giant margins at the top or bottom or giant margins at the sides, um, because, you know, if you're printing small, you can monopolize, <laughs> monopolize your space. Um, so that's, I mean, that's just one way of thinking ahead. Um, you know, it's okay if when you start your story, you find that something changes, um, but you do wanna go mm. in with a plan. You wanna go in like you've, map quested the route. Like, yeah, you might hit traffic and you're gonna have to, you know, take a exit that you didn't plan to or you're gonna have to stop to get gas or whatever. But you have an idea of where you're gonna go and where you're gonna end. Um, also on that note, start like start small. Don't jump right into doing the you know, a three hundred page manga epic. <laughs> like start, you know, start Mm -hmm. with four pages, then go to eight pages, then go to 16. And yeah, one of, one of my students, he had, uh, well, he was working on a big, ambitious project, and one of his friends said to him, at this stage, you should be trying to do little vignettes, you should be doing little yeah. New Yorker-style cartoons, you should be trying to do a gag, you should be trying to do a short story, and then you're gonna figure out what you wanna do by trying all these things. It happened, you know, it's like everybody has that first, no writers have that first novel, and it just ends up, a lot of times that first novel, it just states, and they have this <laughs> ambitious novel they want to do, and it just ends up falling apart because they don't know enough to reach that level. Yeah, and especially if you're planning on doing a comic where you're building this big world, um, you know, especially if you're doing sci-fi or fantasy, maybe you want to just grab two or three characters from your story and just start where some action is happening. You know, jump right to the action. Don't worry about, you know, doing 100 pages mm -hmm. of exposition of this is, these are the secret police and this is how this character ended up on the run and this is their girlfriend. Like, just jump <laughs> into like, yeah, just jump mm -hmm. into like, you know, your main character running from the secret police mm -hmm. with his girlfriend mm -hmm. and then use him running from the cops as his, as your way to explore the world that yeah. he lives in. Chuck Foreman's book, um, uh, Snake Oil, like eight. It's like if anybody read that, it's like got C three PO, like a fictional <laughs> version of C three PO, and he his comic is so inspiring because he follows like thirty years of this guy's life, and it's a thirty five page comic or whatever, and every year gets like one moment that sums up like that year, and he end up getting the big broad strokes of the life through these tiny details. That story's really inspiring. 
So on one, one of the pages is just, first you see him meet a girl, and then years, you jump ahead, and you can tell they're both a little bit older, and they have a kid running around. There's just a moment of the kid crawling on the dad, where he's about to blow his top, <laughs> and the mom's watching him through the window, and it just, that's it, it's six panels of her watching carefully to see what this guy's gonna do. And it's, he could he could jump back, and then he could jump back to when C-3PO is, it's all about like the life of a D-list celebrity. I love that comic. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's talk, is anybody know what time it is? Oh yeah, yeah, right, right. So let me talk about one more thing, and so we're gonna talk about this exercise. Um, overhead shot, a lot of people of course struggle with perspective, and um, I hope you guys can all see this from where you're sitting. Uh, one thing you could think about is the overhead shot. Of course, this scene here of these characters walking, actually, let's take a basketball game. If you have a basketball game, and you have the camera down here, like most basketball games and football games, the camera's way up high, like a 7-Eleven security video. <laughs> so it looks kind of like this. Everybody, you have four people, and they're all the same size. They're all the same size because you're high up enough that it's a great equalizer. You'll see... You'll see the crowd, you'll see the coaches are all the same size. You drop the camera down here to where the action is. You know, they're like, they're like going, I'm free, I'm free. <laughs> Pass your basketball over here. <laughs> and let me play it. Throw your sport in my direction. Yeah, yeah. Pass it down the field, <laughs> and you know you'll have. And if look, there's somebody right here, like right where the camera is. Yeah. This is what you see in a lot of Jack Kirby comics. He's, things get really big really quickly. This guy is like competing with this guy in his ears here. They will be huge. This is kind of normal. If you ever are having coffee with somebody and you take a look, so you're separated by a, a lunch counter. Uh, a diner table, you're here, so this is roughly, almost like being in your head. Mm -hmm. You look at your coffee cup compared to the person who's sitting across from you, it is gonna be like, it's gonna be as big as almost, this, this is definitely. Really far apart. <laughs> so as things get closer, they get distorted and bigger, it's a lot of stuff to worry about. Though I do find that it helps to go bigger when something's in the foreground, just really overkill it and it'll usually work out. I mean, it's even just silhouette, do it in silhouette, just do it in like a, this black shape and usually, you know, if it's the back of somebody's head, you're going to read it as like, oh, that's somebody's head. But another good key is to uh, just, if you feel like I can't handle that without look, looking confident, go way up above them. So let's say, think of an upside down Y or uh, a right side up Y. And in this case, I get a scene where it's a room. Have the line of the Y disappear behind the character here. His buddy comes here. And the angle of the feet are, is actually also going to help the image a lot. So this is pretty exaggerated. Now, if there's a tile floor, I don't even have to worry about the lines going towards the vanishing point. And this is something Chris Ware does all the time. You can also go the other way, so this makes a nice corner. You can also go the other way and have it be more of not a Y, but whatever shape this is. So, so corners help you a lot. And also, it's also fun to see an angle. So when in doubt, put things at an angle. This same corner, like this, is not as fun. Well, that's not bad looking either. But I would it's prefer, okay. <laughs> this line is static and dead to me, but it's okay. And then I have this line here, and we have a side of the building. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing to add to that. Um, you know, do you have like one or two other things I want to say quick before we jump into Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you're drawing, when you start drawing your finished, you know, your panel, I like to try to go from general to specific. So when I start drawing a panel, where's the one, can I make a marker? Yeah. You know, like, okay, here's my panel. Oh, that's not the right marker. 
It's. Oh, that's right here. Um, so, you know, like, okay, here's the panel that I'm going to draw. Um, I'm going to think first about where am I going to put my text? Because I don't want, you know, to draw in something important and then realize, like, oh, shoot, i got to put my balloon over it. So I like to figure out, like, okay, you know, the balloon is going to take up this much space, you know, and this balloon is going to take up this much space. And if it takes up less space than whatever, you just, like, keep drawing. Um, so I like to figure out where kind of where the horizon is, like what's the space that they're in? Like let's just pretend that it we'll go to like, you know, sitting at the dining room table. Like so I know that this guy is gonna be talking in the foreground. You know, so I, I like to say, okay. Um, yeah, and you just start start rough. Don't just like get really into drawing the head and then be like, oh, I don't have room for the rest of the body. Um, <laughs> you know, you, like you gotta think, you know, a step or two ahead of what you're actually doing at the moment. You know, like I gotta think about, okay, well, I put the speech bubble here, but maybe I can, you know, move things around because I wanna have you know, the waitress here <coughs> pouring coffee. And she has a coffee pot, you know. Um, um, oh, one more thing with drawing figures, which is also another thing with starting general to specific, is figure out just really loosely what they're doing. Like, draw this guy running, you know, running away. So I'm going to think of, okay, his head is up here, right? Like, I don't, but I'm not going to start drawing every detail of the head. I'm going to figure out where the spine is going, you know, because that will start giving you an idea of what they're, what the rest of their body is doing. Is their spine curved like this? You know, are they stretching? Are they cheering because they just won a sport thing? Um, you know, figuring out what the spine is doing, and then just figure, you know, just this line of the shoulders and the hips. You know, where are you know are they standing like you know just centered weight at fully <coughs> attention, or are they standing more like relaxed, like where one shoulder is up more because they're gesturing and they're leaning their weight on the other side of their body. So just doing these quick lines, and you know, you're not gonna see them at the end, they're just light. It, it just <coughs> helps to get the idea of what the, you know, what the whole body is doing before you start going in and specifically drawing like, you know, where is their hair, and what are they wearing, and what is their hand doing? Um, yeah, I think I just most of my most of my I, uh, essential tips were just like think ahead. Yeah, <laughs> and that might just be like more of a testament to my personality. No, I, I had that. That was on my <laughs> yeah. top five too. <coughs> just think ahead. Think two steps ahead. So let's talk about the uh, assignment that you guys have in front of you. Um, so let me try to explain it as clearly as, as possible. I came up with this exercise when I taught at SAW last year. And basically the idea is political cartoon as personal. So what I, or just non-political, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna write down a bunch of non-political sayings here. And I want you to look at them and then look at the cartoons in front of you. And, <laughs> um, by the way, do you, do you know how to show these in, in preview? Uh, yeah. You only, only play like 30 of these. So look at these cartoons. I hope you can read these. And think about it's like exercising conceptual thinking. Basically steal from the cartoons. Like take the picture of, um, of um, let's see, it's on the list. Oh, this is great. And this one, the Saul Steinberg drawing. You, if you were going to use that and maybe one other thing to show a watch pot never boils, the one the guys who came from the newspaper, 
It's not that challenging, but that could be a really easy one. Um, all good things come to those who wait. Time heals all wounds. So what I want you to do is basically, I really like to borrow from other people's cartoons, people who draw better than I do. So I picked out all of these different cartoons or some of the uh, greatest critical one frame cartoons ever made. And you don't have to worry about, a lot of times a political cartoons, when you look at the old cartoons, the message that they intended you to get is lost forever. But the, um, the uh, well not forever, but uh, that's not easily accessible. But what you get is uh, the sense of power and drama. So a lot of the old political cartoons would use uh, usually there'd be society would be threatened by some out of control machine or some out of control animal. So you have the contrast between the uh, ci uh, civilization and the uncivilized, or um, uh, bullying or a threat or tyranny, and you get a sense of opposite opposites. So what I want you to do is to look at these cartoons and to think about some of the things we said about basic drawing and think about illustrating some of these ideas. For example, a watch pot never boils. If you're going to do that in a political cartoon style, think about um, what is it that keeps uh, what is it that keeps um, the thing that keeps you from being able to stop from watching a pot is a lack of self-control. So it might be like you take that picture of FDR. If I remember right, he's got a huge chin. <laughs> and then it's like, maybe you have a hand coming down. And you make that irresistible force. Then you draw a pot. So you steal the head, you steal the eyes watching, you have the pot. You know, you can be funny with it if you want. Like, you could even write pot on it or write thing. Write economy on pot. <laughs> <laughs> thing you can't stop looking at. <laughs> and then it's kind of, so, you know, I Netflix. have. Netflix. Write Netflix on Oh, that'd be hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's another one? Um, a, you know, a penny saved is a penny earned. Uh, no, wait. Penny saved is a penny earned. Yeah, a penny saved is a penny earned. And again, think about the thing that might stop you from saving a penny. So that would be college. Is that <laughs> college? Uh, yeah, yeah, like being at SDX right now. <laughs> See, and there's like a lot of greedy figures here. So you have this big greedy figure here. So you could also do a twist on it. This one has this big capitalist sitting on a pound of money. And this gives you a chance to say, how do these people draw these things when I draw it in my own way? A lot of these people did a simple single line. <laughs> Uh, some of them, other ones, used a lot of rendering. Uh, if you look at those of you who saw the one that has the um, uh, the perfect soldier by Gross, such a great drawing to copy elements of, and it has really nice symmetrical room that look, and it's kind of an overhead shot. I mean, the people are getting smaller in the background, but not that much smaller. Do you guys know which one I mean? Did everybody get one of those? And it's a very clean line. There's not a lot of shading. You know what? In fact, you could combine that. You could say, take this capitalist, and then make that he has this amazing skeleton guy. You could put the skeleton guy from the gross drawing in the capitalist's the capitalist head, hand. Excuse me. And then, if you wrote a penny saved is a penny earned, and there's all these like tombstones, starts to become a commentary about war, where the only person who's earning a penny is this huge, disgusting capitalist. I mean, this could be a, bot, a monitor of bodies. All you have to do is draw, is use the reference from the one cartoon. So basically what I'm saying is jam together two or three images, use one of these lines, or your own kind of wise saying, and make a new cartoon out of it. Then you're making a cartoon, you have the slogan at the bottom, and you have the dynamic imagery above it. So in that sense, it's like a political cartoon, but it's not a political message. That that one ended up getting political. Yeah, <laughs> As if, yeah. I mean, I guess he's just There's a way to do it not political. Like I think I just took a drawing. It was, I don't, you know, it was sort of like. Oh, a New York this one here. 
That one that we yeah. just passed, sorry. Yeah. That was one of them. This was actually an 11 year old. Whoa. In impatience. Is Isn't it great? <laughs> and it's all pencil. They just like rub, they just pushed in really hard to make it dark. Uh, and then I um, had them go over it with a little bit of wash afterwards. And if anybody does this today, they want to bring it to my table, or um, Sally, Sally and I are right next to each other, our table. Uh, I actually have watercolor with me. I wouldn't be adverse to helping you do some wash on it. Um, so um, it's probably won't finish it before the end of this, but does anybody like, does anybody like, what, what the hell are you talking about? Does anybody not? So, um, what, so I'll just say it again, right? Or did you have a specific question? Did you have, I mean, you had a question about the whole concept? And what you're asking Take two images from any of the comics that we gave you, cram them together, and then combine them with one of these sayings and see if it jars anything loose. So it's like, basically you're gonna illustrate one of these sayings, a penny saved is a penny earned, or all good things come to those who wait. Under if I have time heals all wounds. And then just look at those images I sent you and say, how could I use these? Combine them with some of my own original drawing and illustrate one of those ideas. So this originally was just like a figure he found in an old cartoon and he just added the hands, like he made up the hands on his own or stole those from yet another cartoon. I'm just going through to see if there's yet another example of one of those. Oh yeah, like there's the lion image, you got the lion with its big enormous mouth, it could be like, you know, time heals all wounds, it could be the mouth, the lion's mouth could be devouring pain. Maybe the label, the lion's yeah. time. Also, if any of you have questions, kind of about comics in general for Josh or I, I'm, I can't speak for Josh, but I mean, I'm happy to answer questions.
was supposed to be like eating the worms. Oh, oh okay. So I, see, I, I see the entrails now. <laughs> That's a question, how to make it look like you're pulling it out of it. I need to put two in just there. Um, while you guys are finishing this, we still have like eight or nine minutes. Um, we're happy to take questions too. Does anybody have like a burning question about teaching or anything like that? Or any of the images which are up here? I mean, doesn't it just kind of change superficially? And then that way, you know, you definitely want to look at new stuff that's coming out and uh, get your arms around that. I think maybe my, my biggest, biggest challenge, my two biggest challenges are, are one, getting people to understand how much of a commitment it is. Um, I think like, like I bought a risograph last year and I thought it would turn me into a technician because I had to. And instead I just ate $900 and got rid of it and it broke down. I couldn't fix it and I threw it out. So sometimes people do that when I'm teaching. They think, oh, I'm going to get to this class and it's going to force me to cartoon. Yeah. And then, then I'm going to do a 200 page epic. And it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Do and it doesn't always work out. And the other thing is, um, Usually, people meet me halfway, and I definitely am always, I try to be really flexible. I try to listen to my students. I try to, um, uh, yeah, I just try to figure out like what they need. Luckily, a lot of the weaknesses that they have are always the same. Like, the proportion issues are the same. The um, sense of not, not closing off the figure is the same. Like, this student was really good at closing off all the lines. There's no place where she didn't wink the shoulder, even though it's not a realistic page, there's no places where she didn't wink the shoulder. Like that one, that's a kid's drawing, and you can see that, whoops, she's such a sweetheart. That first panel, whoops. Stop. <laughs> I did, and that's what made it go. So right there in the second frame, it doesn't, that arm doesn't quite meet that guy's cape, and it's hard to tell how the body works. Just stuff like that, and it flattens it too. So that's that's really common. Um, the other problem is that you sometimes get somebody who has a really, really rigid idea, 
about what they want to do, and it's not accompanied by originality or kind of like a, a sort of like an artistic spirit. So they just want to do a certain type of genre work. And I mean, I love genre work. I love good superhero comics, but some of these, and I come from that background, yeah. but some of these students, they do not, they, they, they don't know. Figuring out how to push them without turning them off completely. Finding that balance. Yeah. Which is, it's a super hard. It's, it sucks because they, a lot of times, they're students who they don't know how to do what they want, but they think they know how it should be taught. So if you're talking about, hey, you know, here's some ideas about design and whatever, you know, here's how you do some shadows, they're like, well, how's that, how's that relevant to doing like rippling muscles and a, you know, <laughs> and a bunch of like gritting teeth? And I'm like, well, it's, you know, just relax a little bit and do it. And <laughs> those are some of the most negative interactions I've had in class, and all the rest, you know, almost uniformly have been great. I think my struggle a lot with teaching is a lot of kids, especially the teenagers, will get really um, overwhelmed about coming up with a new idea on the spot. Um, especially, you know, especially in a group setting, because they'll be like, oh, it's not as good as, like, you know, Joey sitting there. Like, it's not, you know, oh, he's got such a good idea, and my idea is stupid. So doing exercises, you know, like this exercise, where you kind of have a couple of the elements already to start from, it sort of breaks down you know, how intimidating it is. And sometimes you just have to work your way up. But yeah, if mm -hmm. it's like the first day of class and you have, some teenagers will come in and be like, I know exactly what I want to do. I know what I'm doing. I've been, you know, I draw at home all the time, whatever. And then some kids, like, they don't even have an art class at school. So they don't even know where to start. So having something, you know, like Josh's, uh, like the suspect device format, where you give them the first and last panel, you, sometimes that's enough to kind of force them, you know, to make them feel less intimidated by the idea of coming up with something. I think you had a question. It, it, you it's all, just let me add one more thing to that. It's also, if you're interested in being a teacher, it's also really useful to tell your students, let this be a non-judgment zone, non-judgment yeah. zone of your own. Do you have like my question was going to be what you basically just said, but like you know when you work with kids of a certain age group, usually around like twelve or thirteen, there's like this self awareness that hits in all of a sudden. Yeah. And they're like hiding their page and they don't want to draw because they're subconscious now. And do you guys have any like specific exercises or even things that you say to like try to shake um, them out of that a little bit? You know, if I say somebody is like really really uncomfortable or struggling with a group activity or especially a group critique, I'll kind of accommodate and talk one-on-one -on -one to them. Um, usually, I mean, usually after, you know, because, uh, you know, we do a two-week summer program where it's just two weeks every day. And usually by the second or third day, people start to calm down, you know, they start to kind of realize <coughs> that everybody is in a completely different skill zone. Um, Especially because it's all, you know, for the teen class, we'll, you know, we'll have like a 12 year old and an 18 year old, and they'll be at completely different places. Um, yeah, I, you know, <coughs> sometimes it, it kind of works itself out. Um, usually, like, <coughs> doing stuff that gets people laughing, like humorous stuff, tends to, like, make people calm down. <laughs> so, you know, doing a doing an exercise where the outcome of it is, you know, going to end up funny in the end, <coughs> even if it's unintentionally, sort of gets, you know, it, it gets them to take it a little less seriously. I think that that's, I think what I'm getting at is getting them to take, you know, I mean, obviously, yes, they should take it seriously. They should treat it as, you know, school as learning. But also not to take it too seriously, and just to remember that what they're working on is just like one thing for one day, you know, in their life. And you know, in ten years, they might not even like remember what they did in the summer of 2010. You know, so.
just that, just saying like this is just one thing you're doing. This is just one step towards mm -hmm. something else. It's like okay, you know, you used up an hour, two hours of this thing on your of your time on this thing that you might not like, yeah. but you probably learned something from it. It's really hard. I found that the best what some you got to be so just like anything else, and you know, and and that's that um, constitutes success in indie comics is you have to be so lucky and kind of talented and kind of have an, and, and have a lot of generosity. I found lately um, the best thing is having two teachers because if you, kids will exhaust you and having the other teach, I mean, I-, I Especially can, teenage boys. <laughs> being a, yeah, being a woman teaching teenage boys, it's just like they, they know, they learn fast how to like undermine you. So sometimes it's good to have like, <coughs> Yeah. Yeah. Somebody who's a muscle. <laughs> yeah. Not only the male who's the muscle. I had this TA this summer named Raina, and she was so, she, I don't know, she came from different parents than I did. Not that my parents were permissive, but she, she, was, she was really not, she, she, had, she had real standards. I'm like, a, a lot of times I'm just like, oh, this is what kids are doing now, yeah. right? And she's like, no, 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 you got to nip stuff in the bud. And it's just like they're going to think, you know, you have to have, you have to think on your feet. Like if some of the kids said a smart ass thing to her, she would come right back at them and be like, "Well, you're fired from this class," or as a joke, you know, yeah. and, you know, you just got an F. And um, see, like I can't do that banter, but I know people who, who can. She's so <laughs> she's so bantery. She's so bantery. Yeah. What time is it? Are we gonna, are we gonna run into the next thing? So I love I love teaching this. If anybody wants to come to our table and show what they did and like make us laugh, I would love that. This is mine. I use I use FDR. It's the person who used the wooden seal. Originally I was doing it, and Sally said this looks like the lion is throwing up on somebody. So it works better. Sideways. Healing vomit. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.